as stated, my name is uh, Hugh Herr. I direct the uh, biomechatronics group at the uh, MIT Media Lab. Uh, so I, I thought I'd begin today with a, a personal story because it motivates uh, my professional story. Uh, in 1982, I was in a tragic mountain climbing accident, and I lost both my legs below the knee due to tissue damage from frostbite. So I stand before you supported entirely by artificial means. Basically, from the knee down, I'm a bunch of nuts and bolts, titanium, silicon, so on and so forth. So after my legs were amputated, my, I asked my uh, rehab physician uh, what I would be able to do as a bilateral amputee. And he said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to I mountain climb. That's my life's passion. And he said, well, you should be able to drive a car without hand, with uh, hand controls. Um, you should be able to eventually walk with, with uh, canes, two canes. He said, but you will never, ever be able to climb mountains again. And I was, of course, completely devastated. And, and then I went, I went to my uh, hospital room, and I said, he, he doesn't know anything about mountain climbing. How does he know? <laughs> so the first lesson is uh, the key to innovation is courage. Uh, don't listen to anyone that tells you it, it, it ain't possible, because most ideas uh, can be achieved. Um, so here, here I'm climbing. I'm about 50 feet off the ground without a rope. And here you see my artificial leg. So how, how was it possible for me to return to my sport um, again given the fact that I was without legs? And the answer is, of course, innovation. Um, so I went to the machine shop, and I started grinding and sawing, and, and I built these uh, artificial legs that allowed me to return to my chosen sport of the vertical world of rock and ice climbing. So here's a foot. Um, I'm afraid I'm standing in someone's way. Um, that I'm able to wedge into a rock fissure, even where the human foot is not able to penetrate. So very small rock fissures. And by rotating my leg, I can get this uh, cam-shaped device to wedge into the rock crevice. And then I just stand up and make progress at the mountain. To, to figure out how, how to adjust the stiffnesses of this prosthetic foot, I actually looked at how the human foot uh, responds in a similar type of loading condition. And given the fact that I'm a bilateral amputee, I was able to change my height. Here I'm a towering seven foot tall able to reach hand and footholds that my other climbing colleagues are not able to reach. <laughs> this is a, a wonderful opportunity. Um, when in my first several weeks in undergraduate school, I decided to uh, conduct an experiment. Every day I went to school, I increased my height by an inch. <laughs> and I, I wanted to see how, how long would it take for someone to say, gee, what's happening here? And I, I think I got nearly to seven feet tall. Granted, <laughs> I wasn't, I wasn't terribly popular at the time, but someone says, Hugh, you, you, know, you seem to be growing. And I said, of course I'm growing. College learning is a growing experience. <laughs> of course, I went uh, ice climbing, and here I just said, you know, I, I, don't need a, I don't need a boot. I don't need a mountain climbing boot. Let's just go right from the prosthesis and weld the prosthesis directly to a crampon so I can uh, penetrate the ice wall and make progress up the mountain. So from this experience, I learned many things. Uh, the first thing I learned is that technology, uh, in innovation in the realm of technology, is extraordinarily powerful. You can, you can advance ideas, uh, technological platforms, and really, really make a difference in people's lives. Um, another thing I learned, I learned something about uh, how to innovate. Um, so the area with which I work is about building devices that attach, that connect to the human body, that somehow serve the human body. So what I learned is by, by looking into nature, by studying how the human body works, one can try to grapple with the complexity of, of building uh, a device for the human, it's extracting secrets from nature and using those as design principles. So today I'm going to talk about the simplicity, how you uh, manage uh, complexity and through biological inspiration. So there's two approaches. One is uh, to put the body into the machine. So 
In this approach, you can study how a human works. For example, you can study how humans move, how they balance, and then you can use those principles when you design a humanoid robot, for example, that uh, behaves like a human. Another approach is to put machines into the body. Uh, this is a, a one area in this realm is neuroprostheses, implants in the human body that actually detect human intent. Now, why, why simplicity? The, the reason is that I'm sure everyone in this room today has been frustrated by technology. The cell phone doesn't work, the computer doesn't work. You know, we're, you know, this device, I can barely figure out how to use it. So can we think of, in our, uh, as we innovate, really having a deeper understanding on how humans work so we can do a better job designing these uh, interfaces and the devices so they think like us, they move like us. And really, from the human's perspective, the device is very simple because it's more like us. The device itself may be very complex, but its, its interaction with the human is simple. So a few examples. Um, we, in my laboratory, we developed a prosthetic knee uh, several years ago. It's called the Rio knee. Um, this is a, an artificial knee for people to use that are amputated above the knee. Uh, there's a computer on board that, and sensors, and the knee's always, always adjusting its own resistance to help the amputee move. Um, and this, this, is a, this is an adaptive process. So what, what happens is there's sensors inside this blue envelope, and there's an algorithm. And there's, there's uh, in, the, in the memory of the microprocessor, uh, there's information on what a normal human gait looks like. Then the knee uses that information to try to coax the amputee, the patient, towards a more natural way of movement. And that happens automatically. And so it's adaptive. There's no, no buttons to push or knobs to turns by the human. But we're not perfect. Um, we get it right about 80% of the time, the adaptive algorithm. Um, so we have this PDA that the professional can plug in and set their own control targets. So here's the device. Uh, so here's a unilateral patient, as you can see. So it res results in a fairly natural gait. All we did with this gentleman is bolted the knee to his body. And the knee, because it knows something about human movement, figures it out so that he can walk at different speeds. Here's another gentleman uh, that's walking down steps without uh, having to use the railing. Again, the system detects that there's stairs there, and it knows something about how a normal uh, biological leg descends steps and does the right, uh, outputs the right values. So the knee allows uh, one to go over rough terrain. And this gentleman actually decided to climb a wall and do something rather crazy. Um, moving on. <laughs> Not recommend. Moving on, we're now developing uh, foot ankle prosthesis. This is the first powered uh, ankle prosthesis in the world. Uh, here I'm walking with the device. And we've programmed it be to behave like conventional prostheses that don't behave like a normal biological limb. That's about my um, most comfortable speed. I'm walking about one meters per second. When you walk at your most comfortable speed, you're at about 1.3 meters per second. So when, what we did is we studied how the human ankle works, and we, we tuned the stiffnesses of the springs here to match the Achilles tendon and applied the right biomimetic architecture. And we, when I walk in this new prosthesis, I'm getting this added power now I'm turbocharged, just like your ankle. And it's, it's like for me, my accident was 1982. It's for me, it's like when you hit the moving walkway at the airport and you go, woo, you know, that's what it's like. <laughs> so biological inspiration. So a great way to, to uh, conceive of a world where the devices that interact with our bodies are not, not so uh, frustrating is the area of neural, neural prostheses. Imagine a world where you know, Microsoft World is really pissing you off, and you, you just want to tell the computer to knock it off. Like, you're getting upset. Please, please respond in an appropriate manner. So imagine we had, if we had tools to really extract human emotion, human movement intent, and so on and so forth. So here's a, um, a device. Uh, it's called the Bion. It was developed by the Alfred Mann Foundation. They're close to Los Angeles. It's a centimeter and a half in length and two millimeters in diameter. 
You can implant the bion into muscle, uh, and it needs to go near the neuromuscular junction. You can do two things. One thing is you can take an external power supply and activate the muscle and get it to contract. Okay? Second thing you can do is use the bion as a sensor to measure the extent to which the nervous system has activated uh, the muscle. So for the application of ampu amputation, what we can do is we can inject bions into the musculature of the residual limb so that the amputee can just think, fire their muscles that send up wirelessly to the robotic uh, appendage uh, that's attached to the human. So here's an example of just uh, an able body limb controlling a robot through uh, these electrical activations. So recently, um, I walked down steps for the first time in a, in a natural manner. Um, and I used uh, this electromyographic control. <clears throat> so I'm actually controlling the foot's position as I'm walking down steps. And it's really interesting because I feel my legs as a phantom awareness. And it's, it's a dynamic awareness. So I can, right now I'm swiveling my ankles and wiggling my toes. When I, can, when I do that, you can see my physical muscles firing an elaborate pattern. <clears throat> so we can extract that information. So when I move my phantom limb, the robotic limb tracks those movement desires. <clears throat> we also build robots that wrap around impaired limbs. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, this gentleman suffered a stroke. And uh, <clears throat> this device <clears throat> pushes on him. Um, you'll see in a moment, this device pushes on him. And between his body and the device, uh, there's natural motion restored. <clears throat> so we're able to increase symmetry between left and right sides. <clears throat> and he's now able to walk at a, a very high speed. <clears throat> so this is a really uh, an interesting device because by studying the human ankle, we can develop, sorry, I have the flu. We developed a control system that as, as the stroke patient moves, that movement retrains their spinal circuitry. Um, <clears throat> or the nervous system uh, circuitry. So they uh, typically, a stroke patient, improves in function. And what you want the device to do is actually back away as the person's getting stronger. So the goal of this device is, uh, and it does in fact do that, as the person's getting stronger, it actually minimizes what it does. Okay? And the goal is that eventually the person just uh, doesn't use the device and throws it in the trash. So another <clears throat> example of um, Simplicity through biological inspiration. So again, let's conceive of a world where devices aren't as frustrating as they are today. A world in which we have a fundamental understanding of what we are and we exploit that understanding uh, to make uh, better, better technology. Thank you. Keep you up here. Yeah, sorry. Can you take 30 more seconds? I'm good. I'm good. Um, obviously, uh, one of the characteristics of the Iraq War has been saving of more lives, but therefore of, of more people coming back with uh, uh, lost limbs and other kinds of uh, nerve and spinal injuries. I have read that a lot of more money now is going into your sort of work. Is That's that correct. correct? And, That's correct. A lot more money. Are we seeing some? Uh, uh, maybe it isn't something that's susceptible to more money, but are we seeing uh, some advances because of this? <clears throat> uh, yes, we are, and I believe uh, we'll see um, a lot of advances in the coming decade. This is in a very exciting time because of the war on terrorism. There's now, as you, as you stated, a lot of money in this uh, area of research. That's one reason that it's a, it's a, a unique time. The second reason is over the last several decades, there have been uh, <clears throat> key disciplines that are relevant to this space that have matured. Robotics, tissue engineering, machine learning. And what, what we need to do, uh, the folks in my field, if we can combine those various disciplines, we can really, really uh, make, I believe, a profound difference in people that are suffering from physical disability. So I, I predict in the coming decade, we will, the world will see unprecedented change in this area. Well, thanks. Sure. Really.